Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to a phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 3, titled Kill Shot. It originally premiered on, on October 10th, 1986. We have three writers for this episode. Martin Kumpfer, Leon Ichasso, and Manuel Arce. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pronounce it Arce. It, it could be Ar- Arc? Arce? Arce? Manuel Ars. Ars. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I think this uh, this week's going to be full of poor pronunciation. <laughs> Martin Comfer and Leon Ichasso, both veteran Miami Vice writers, including writing the episode Bought and Paid For and Little Miss Dangerous. Oh, so, so some favorites. Yes, on our, on there, our list. there is some veterans in here, including Leon Ichasso as the director of this episode. So we have a veteran Miami Vice team that's working on this episode and it's not just the writers and the directors it's also essentially every other character in the episode too yeah I mean it's basically we mention it every week but Miami Vice has a way of recycling actors to play different characters and it seems like rather than get a big name guest star this week they just hired every other bit part guest star that they've had in the past (laughs) show up in this episode together before going on to appear in numerous other episodes it's the stable they have out back with all these miami vice extras they keep them back out there on chain free range extras (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah there is this weird connection between like three of them that all appeared in this superboy tv show that i've never heard of i don't know if one of the writers eventually i'm assuming someone else from vice was responsible for the superboy show before we get started, I can check in and go to each other's lives. And guys, I have a story for you this week. We were on a road trip to Northern California last week. That's why we had the shortened episode uh, that hit your feeds last week. And so we were, me and Melissa and the family, we were on a road trip. And while we were there, me and my son decided we will go on a hike in the Santa Cruz Mountains. While we were in the mountains, we went up to go see the giant redwoods. There's a grove of giant redwoods. It's a park named Henry Cowell Park. I head down a trail, make a couple turns, head down another trail, and suddenly I am totally confused at where I am and completely lost in the Santa Cruz Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> then panic starts to set in. Because <laughs> you're in charge and he thinks you know where you're going. Did, did Granger Bob have to come save you? <laughs> because I was so flipped around. Eventually, what I did was we walked all the way back down to the highway and then walked up the road that we drove in to park. Um, We were were that lost. You were that lost. (laughs) If you're going to get lost in a set of mountains, the Santa Cruz Mountains aren't the worst ones to get lost in because you're not going to freeze to death. True. You know, I I don't believe that there are very many bears up there. Um, There's lots of people around. Yeah, there's a lot of people, and it's a holiday weekend, so, you know, a lot of people doing it. I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to be attacked by a wild turkey or two. (laughs) Screw those turkeys. I've been attacked by them before. (laughs) Yeah, they're not nice. (laughs) But luckily, we were able to survive and found out that the Grove of Giant Redwoods we were looking for were just on the opposite side of the parking lot. (laughs) <laughs> that we chose not to go, the path we chose not to go down because it looked like uh, it wasn't, we wanted to head out more towards the wilderness. <laughs> Mistakes were made. <laughs> the best part of all of this is that Melissa's hearing it for the first time that I took her, our 10 year old son and got lost in the forest. You took my child and tried to get him lost in the forest. <laughs> and there I was thinking, like, oh no, Dominic knows where he's going. He'll never get lost. I wasn't even worried about it at all. Oh, and, and I can that, picture, been... like, 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 I bet you, you go back to that parking lot. I can just picture there's a sign that's pointing toward the redwoods. Yes. And then they're just walking <laughs> right past it. Like, no, this is not the right way. Well, speaking of being confused, let's talk about this episode and the weird sport of high lie. Let's go talk about this episode. So when we open up, it's the same song and dance as we've seen in so many Miami Vice openings or just throughout the episode. Burnett is making a deal. He's on the boat because, you know, that's all Burnett really brings to the table is that he's got a fancy car and a boat. And it's gorgeousness. <laughs> Can we just all take in how amazingly <laughs> hot he looks in this episode with his big spiky hair. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about D- two keys. This is so bushly. Why are we yeah, even wasting Crockett's time? <laughs> Crockett has set up a deal with uh, someone named Silvio. He's asking in the conversation he wants to speak to his boss named Morales. 
the vice team is watching from afar. So Crockett gives the word and the police come busting in. And what my what I noticed here in the bust is that one Crockett and Silvio get away. And that's the gag that they have on Silvio that makes that's it look like thing, yeah. Burnett is a real, you know, he's a legit dealer because he saves Silvio from the bust. But what is up with the Miami PD and having like a mounted M60 on the front of their boat? I have no idea. <laughs> and did you see the way they drove that boat? It was going to tip over like six times. <laughs> yeah, it just turns in the wars. They just start blowing up boats in the harbor. <laughs> I know. I never. And but they, he like literally like turns off the lights and just turns off his boat and like coasts in and they never see him. Just the mounted machine gun mm-hmm. on the front of the boat and it lights up all the people on the docks and then blows up the dealer's <laughs> boat. <laughs> yeah. So now you wonder I want to get to Barnett the badass. That's what <laughs> I want to get to. Because after they get away, he turns and goes all Bobby Knight on the uh, dealer, <laughs> choking him out. <laughs> Chucks him over the overboard after he says, I'm taking the money back, bitch. Yeah, because he tells Silvio, he's like, now I, I demand, I saved your life, I demand a meeting with Morales, and by the way, I'm holding the money hostage until you set up that meeting. Sil- Silvio says, he's just going to kill you, and Burnett's like, whatever, I'll take that chance. Like, why would you do that when you're on the boat with somebody who's like telling you, you know, I want a meeting? He should have just said like, yeah, sure, I'll get you a meeting. Didn't he know yeah. he was going to get thrown off the boat? <laughs> yeah. Also, Melissa, well, so you were saying like, for how many people Crockett throws Does over the boat? No, these people can swim. Like, because otherwise he's just murdering everybody. <laughs> like, somebody can, there's got to be some of these people that can't swim just sink like a stone. Me. That's why I said that. When, when, when I saw him, I'm like, I'd be dead right now. If that was me, I'd die. <laughs> I can't swim for crap. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I, where's this Barnett been? Burnett been? I mean, see this guy, you know, instead of, you know, shady businessman Burnett we've seen up to this point, this guy's a badass. This is much different than what he normally is because normally he's just like the setup guy, right? And mm-hmm. he doesn't have any muscle. He's not, he doesn't have anything. He's just, hey, I know everyone in Miami. You're looking to move some drugs. You, I can I help you out. You. He's yeah. like connecting to the dots. But yeah. now he's like, no, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to. But he turns back into the connect later in this episode so he's doing both yeah (laughs) after he dumps silvio into the water we go to the opening credits when we come back from the opening credits we're at the precinct the team's reviewing what they found out about silvio obviously burnett is going to be under close watch by the vice team and so castillo assigns switek to monitor crockett's boat just basically spend the night on it yeah yeah uh, and of course, I text very nervous about Elvis, but we all know Elvis is no threat. <laughs> no. And also, did you notice yeah. how um, he's like, yeah, you need to monitor his boat. But then Rico's like, OK, so you can come spend the night in my house then. <laughs> you don't want to spend the night with Switek. I thought that was mean. He's like, hey, you want to you want to bunk at my place? He's like, yeah, I'll sleep with you. I don't want to sleep with Switek. If Switek gets killed, that's his deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and that that's after a little joke, you know, oh, what's Elvis been eating lately? Oh, detectives. We know though, that Elvis ain't eating anything. He's also not moving or not breathing. Because I think he's dead. (laughs) (laughs) A customs agent comes in. He's working with the vice team. His name is Frank. And he's part of the bus. He's part of U.S. Customs, who's been trying to bring down Morales, who Silvio is is linked up with. So he says, hey, great job today, guys. How about we go out to dinner and go watch a highlight match? Go see my brother. I'm going to go to dinner with my brother. That's what you think. Yes. Yeah. So we head so over for, to the Highlight High Court. For those of you do- that don't know, Highlight is apparently the, some kind of hybrid of cricket and handball. <laughs> um, it's uh, like that the, game uh, when you were a kid where you have the ball. stick and then with the wiffle ball yes. and then you like throw it, but just yeah. make it like a lot bigger. So it's almost like lacrosse, but uh-huh. no, I don't know. I can explain it. That's really weird. And that's my first question, John. Yeah, no, what it, the fuck is highlight? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody uh-huh. knows or how to pronounce it either. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently it's popular in Philippi- in the Philippines and in Latin culture. And according to the Bosque government, wherever mm-hmm. the hell that is, um, <laughs> they sure claim it's, it's the fastest, I, I believe so. They claim it is the fastest sport in the world with the ball traveling uh, upwards right? of 188 miles per hour. Wow. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, those, you know, you know what it looks like, though, too. Like, like those little... 
those little sticks remind me of uh my mom has these sticks to throw the tennis ball for the dogs oh yeah yeah it makes it so they're like an yeah. extension of your arm and you could just huck those things you know <laughs> and, and that's what it kind of reminds me of just in like a handball court with a baseball or like something, really something like <laughs> the only thing that i read about high live was that it's really popular in gambling circles so it's not really taken seriously as a sport, I guess, because no, of it's that. More for, it's more for making money. Like yeah, and so wants. you find it in a, a lot of cases around dog tracks yep. and horse tracks. I was going to say that. And yeah. it's really only popular in the South like, and really only in Florida. So it really is an exclusively a Florida thing. And they were really trying to give you the background on it because if, I don't know if you remember, but later on in the episode, they talk about Frank says he's whatever that is, Basque, or mm -hmm. he says what he is. Yeah. He's like, I'm just a I'm just a Basque kid growing up or something like that. In this scene where we show up at the highlight court, they take careful consideration in their conversation when they sit down with Frank to kind of give that background on what highlight is for the uh, audience. Because the audience is going, what the hell is this? <laughs> what the hell are they I doing? Thought, <laughs> I thought it was funny that actually that should have been the clue that it was a gamble thing when i first watched it i was like what's with all the old ladies who like normally pay bingo being there and yeah. the crowds with like their cards and stuff I was like yeah okay that, that's what i should have been known it was for money making <laughs> and credit in, to in matches they, they announced the keynote numbers yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> credit to miami vice here though that this is a miami thing right so this is uh miami culture seeping into so they're keeping that aspect in season three with dick wolf that it's still um things that are related to miami we having given up on that yet yeah exactly so we find out that frank's brother tico so not to be confused with rico thank you my revised writers that tico is his brother who's a great high high player who does it for the art <laughs> not the money or the thrill <laughs> or the ladies are, are you sure because they really make it seem like during this episode like he's gonna lose big hundreds of dollars worth of contract <laughs> hundreds <laughs> Chico's team. I don't know. Squadron. Team, yeah, team. Whatever it is. Uh, family. Crew, no. <laughs> Win their match. And Frank takes the duo back into the locker room to go pick up Chico to go to dinner. But then when they get there, Chico's already left. Frank is very confused by that. And but we find out on the next scene when we head over to Chico's hotel. He had a hot date. Yes. He's with um his hooker friend. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were insinuating that later on that she wasn't a hooker, though, anymore, because she was no. just, I don't know. I, I think what they're that. saying no. later is that no. that's what she does is just with those types of, okay, is like gotcha. with athletes I wasn't stuff. sure, like, if she had stopped being yeah. a hooker because he was, like, taking care of her or something, maybe. No, no, that that's what makes me laugh about this, because she was, uh, they were saying she was bragging about her being, uh, like, a high class hooker now. Yeah, that's true. Because she was spending time with all of these thousand dollar worth <laughs> players, professional <laughs> athletes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you see, know. We see Tico. He's drinking heavily. He's taking pills. Uh, I think there's even one point in time later and that's what we see him doing coke. He's got a great mullet. I think yeah, that should be said. Yes. <laughs> curly. Curly black hair mullet. <laughs> the woman walks out of the bathroom and she's like, I'm tired of you. I need a real man. And then immediately starts questioning him if he's into little boys. Like yeah. this takes it's, a turn it's, it's real like a fast. Really yeah, and he's like, please don't say that. Like, at first, like, don't say that to me. God, <laughs> lady, you're cold. We never get any explanation of why she goes that route either. Like, is there some truth behind that statement or something? Is that what's the No, because he, he's impotent. So mm. she's just saying, like, he's impotent. He can't perform. I'm, like, trying to be. <laughs> Ouch, lady. <laughs> yeah, he it's, can't perform because he's yeah, taking those yeah, pills. So. That's what yeah. he's saying, right? Yeah. And so then she's like, oh, well, hit I, him I where it hurts. Say, I'm pretty sure that the or at least it said that coke side effect of coke is an impotency too as she's questioning him about in his sexuality he's finally yells at her to stop and attacks her we have a freeze frame where he's like grabbing her by, by the neck and it freeze frame so then we fade out and we when, when we come back chico is there and with someone named mrs bautista and with her bodyguards including Muscles the Wonder Woman bodyguard. Oh my god, that lady like Jesus. something. <laughs> she, <laughs> she is she is by far the only her? person I've seen in the show that is like she's a bodyguard. <laughs> yeah, like right away you're like, nope, this lady is a bodyguard. Well, why else would she be there? I, I think she's the most yoked woman I've seen. Yeah, she's like of all the bodyguards yeah, we've seen, like we've yoked. seen the guys that have like the curly mustaches and, and all this stuff and stuff. And it's like, yeah, 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 whatever. And then you see her as bodyguard, like, do not fuck around with Miss Bautista. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
no, she, and she never smiles either. All she does is, and she wears all those sleeveless dresses because she can't get one to fit around her giant guns. <laughs> Tico is saying you can't believe what he did. Miss Bautista is saying, don't worry about it. You're too important. Go home, relax. We're going to take care of this. Chico leaves and the hooker sits up and says, hey, you're going to, I need a raise for this act that I just did. So Chico didn't actually kill her. And Miss Bautista's all yeah, smiles so, like, you got it. Sure. Don't worry. Make sure she gets so, home safely. <laughs> so fake orgasms apparently are one price and then faking her death is another price. <laughs> so this is what gets confusing to me because they have her fake her death with the guy and then she pops up and she's fine in the next few scenes we find that they kill her anyway they kill her and just toss her into the water well see i think so it's like like, well i think they were just hoping he would kill her and then it wouldn't Mm. and they wouldn't have to and she just happened to survive it (laughs) (laughs) so you can't even get that right (laughs) tico can't complete anything (laughs) he can't finish any job (laughs) he really is impotent (laughs) so the what we put together here is that Miss Batista wanted Chico to think he killed a hooker so that she will get power over him through Morales mm-hmm. over through Frank. So it's going to get really, really, really confusing detailed. here. So in other words, she wanted to use this against Frank to blackmail him into mm-hmm. getting what she wanted from Frank, who's a customs agent. Yes. Have her fake to death, but then kill her anyway. Because she can't have that loose end, right? Like you mm-hmm. can't have that girl just go around saying like, I faked my death and here I am. <laughs> he, someday he's going to mm-hmm. see her. Yeah, but I mean, okay, now, the, the, why don't they ask Tico to just finish the job? I don't know. But the <laughs> stupid part about this is that hooker is really dumb. I mean, I get it. You're a, not that bright as it is. But what did she think they were going to do with her after she faked her death? She uh, yeah. can't go out. You can't go around uh, if you're supposed to be dead. I don't know. But apparently, uh, storyline aside, she must have made an impact on Don Johnson because she would later... Here, his music video for the song Heartbeat. I watched that video um, millions of times. <laughs> she did such a fantastic job in that video uh, that Tears for Fears hired her to dance on a pole in their music video, Woman in Chains. <laughs> I mean, they weren't typecasting her. She just like was really good at pole dancing. <laughs> also, I think it should be noted she was in a movie called Salsa. That's an amazing movie for people who like terrible 80s movies. <laughs> It's what it's. I mean, it says it right there. It's about her being the best salsa dancer ever, and she's not, by the way. <laughs> hey, it's, it, if it gets her off the pole, then it gets her off the pole. There's no pole, but there's a lot of similar dancing, though. So. Bautista has made the deal. She's basically been able to line er- everything up that for what she needs to do. The vice team have found the dead hooker in the docks. So we're just going to quickly move along to where the duo have finally gotten their meet with Morales. They're going to head out to Morales's yacht. They, Sylvia was able to set up the deal and they're all smiles on that boat. Burnett is there as the connection to Cooper who has got $5 million and is looking to buy 300 keys, but only wants to deal directly Nine with million. Morales. Nine million. Oh. Nine million. Wow. $9 million. Yeah. Am I the he only one that thought... He wants you to know. He's got nine million. Did <laughs> yeah, I mention that Tubbs has nine million around. dollars? <laughs> Am I the only one that thought that Tubbs was kind of lazy in this one? I mean, no Jamaican accent. No <laughs> South African accent. He was just regular old New York Tubbs. He's egotting, Wilson. <laughs> well, he ain't egotting. He wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't emoting anything in this episode. <laughs> he didn't need to, Wilson. Who needs he an accent amazing. when you've got nine million dollars? <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> No, he might look amazing, but he does not look as good as Don Johnson in this episode. <laughs> this is a very wishy-washy meeting, too, because basically, th- you know, the whole meeting goes through and it's like, we want we want these keys and we want them by Friday. And it's like, well, maybe we'll get it to, to you by Friday <laughs> yeah. or maybe we yeah, won't. Maybe. <laughs> maybe if you stick around, you might see, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, maybe we'll give you the money. Well, maybe we'll give you the trouble. <laughs> well, Fine. Maybe we'll find like, someone I, else I, to deal with. <laughs> I, I'm surprised they left not being just super confused. Like, are they actually going to call us? Did, you did, did give, give them a number, number, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Morale, the last thing I'll note here for this scene is that Morales is saying, I'll tell Silvio to contact you. And they're like, I don't want to talk to Silvio. Because he's a dork. <laughs> no one wants to talk to him. The last, thing I will, the last thing I will say about these scene, this scene is that that guy's sunglasses are fantastic. 
<laughs> you see those giant ass sunglasses he was yeah. wearing, like his little homie hanging out next to him, the guy that doesn't say anything. Yeah, like yeah, the guy's like a security guard or whatever. His whole face was just sunglasses. <laughs> well, that's the reason why I bring up Silvio, is that because the next scene is is Crockett stops for coffee. And it's, it must be like the next day. Yeah. So the next morning he's morning. stopping for coffee at one of the little like Cuban the little coffee. Cu- Cuban coffee. It's like a shot of coffee. Silvio comes up from behind Crockett and says, I can't wait to kill you. But by the way, Morales wants to do business yeah, with you. I don't you. understand that whole meeting at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You eat crap food food, Crockett. I'm gonna murder you. See you Friday. <laughs> And then Crockett beats him up. Yeah, Burnett's like, uh-oh. Yes. I'm not playing around today. Badass Burnett, Burnett again. Yeah. Badass Burnett just kicks the crap out of him. It, it, it's the same guy, too. Like, you start yeah. to wonder, like, is he just really not like Silvio? <laughs> the best part about it is that it's the guy behind the counter. He's like, eh. Keeps yeah, he's making like, coffee, whatever. lights his cigar. Yeah, I know. He just looks at Crockett like, brother again? Another guy? <laughs> He did insult the guy's restaurant. He said he, he eats crap food. It's on. <laughs> Defend <Yeah>. our honor. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know what I forgot to mention? We got, we talking about how Batista is linked up with Morales. I forgot to mention that at the end of the Tico scene where he had killed the hooker, she calls Morales and says it's done, like yeah, it's been like set it's up. Done, yeah. So we see as viewers that Morales and Bautista, Bautista are linked up early. Yeah. So now we see just a brief scene we see at Frank's office. Remember the U.S. Customs agent. We see in his office that he gets a call. It's Bautista, and she has set up a meet with him. So then we quickly go over to Mrs. Bautista's house. Frank comes in. He's alone. And she shows him a recording that they had set up, like a a security camera that they had set up in the room showing Tico kill the hooker. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like a snuff movie they're watching (laughs) or fetish porn. I don't know. Well, Frank is watching it like it's not the first scene. (laughs) <laughs> and Frank is watching it as if he's like, ah, oh, not again. Not another hooker. <laughs> it's distracted, man. The buff chick was in the back, and I kept I looking know. at her. I know. I <laughs> know. The buff chick has jacked everything. Miss <laughs> Batista is very happy with herself, by the way. She's got a gigantic smile on her Can face. Can we just talk about that lady's an evil bitch? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. She is. She's so evil. The whole entire time, she's so smug about everything she's done. She's so right smug. And smug she, basically, she basically tells him, like, your brother's got a temper and a small penis. Yeah. Yeah. She talks about, like, I don't know which is worse, his temper or a small penis. Like, and when ouch. she says that, the camera cuts to this other security guard with a mustache. And he's just like, she nods his head. He's like, yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. It is really small. Yeah. <laughs> no, she talks about his performance. We've like, all yeah, seen it. Performance. Yeah. And she's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, it's a bad yeah, performance. Yeah, I've seen it. It's pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, he really we watched all the videos. That. We got a whole collection of them. <laughs> Morales comes down from his uh, room upstairs. Ascends yeah, he stairs. sends the stairs down. Frank knows him. Obviously, Frank has been trying to investigate him for years, and so they know each other. Frank says he should have killed Morales a long time ago. Well, it should be noted that Frank actually put Morales away years ago, which mm-hmm. is why they brought him in to this investigation in the beginning. But he he only did limited time. He did like a day. And what how the scene ends is that Morales tells Frank, hey, "I own you now. I have this tape on your brother. He's a big time high life player. <laughs> that matters everywhere except for out of this room. Big time. <laughs> he He'll never play balls. professional sports again. <laughs> not in Miami. Not in Dade County. Or in wait, what's the other county they play this game in?" <laughs> We head over to the precinct. The duos, the duo and the ladies have like this weird hallway conversation as they go by. Gina's asking about if he's hooked up with the T- hot Tico. Tico. And he's yeah. like, oh, you can't handle him. Like, what? <laughs> he's a little Here's too the fast ladies for you. <laughs> The ladies' yeah, outfits are so like eighties, like like I like uh, that Trudy's, Trudy's got the long sleeves, like they're really big, and then a cut out stomach. But then it's cut out, so you can see her stomach. Yeah. What? <laughs> what they find out is that Mrs. Batista has come in, and she says that the hooker who had been killed was from her quote unquote stable. Yeah. <laughs> Willingly, she comes in like on involuntarily, like you know, hey, I, yeah. I should, I thought I should come by and tell mm-hmm. you I'm a total evil witch that 
planet. It's bad for business that my hookers are getting killed. So I want to ho- I want to help you guys catch them. By the way, I'm leaving. See you later. And I'm not. I, nobody knows anything. So don't yeah. ask them any questions. They're not going to tell you anything. <laughs> Castillo tells the ladies all to still follow up with all the stable hookers. <laughs> Is it just me or does Castillo feel like in this episode he feels like he doesn't give a crap about any of yeah, this? Yeah, he's like, God he's like, damn it. Whatever. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, I don't care. Can't not give a flying F about anything in this episode. Yeah. Like, he was phoning it in. He's like, I don't even care. Like, yeah. She's like, well, they're not going to tell us anything. He's like, I don't care. Whatever. Just question him anyway. Later on, when Frank gets mad at him, he's like, yeah, whatever. I could have contacted you if I wanted to, but I didn't. Whatever. (laughs) Yeah. So when we leave from the precinct you go back over to frank's and frank and tico are having a conversation and tico's like you always push me to be great and have a good time i don't know why you've been so hard on me i i want to know what went wrong (laughs) what he's like i thought you liked highlight he's like i mean i did but i didn't want to make a career out of it you told me i had to though well wait a minute hold on stop the presses you're telling me there's no money in (laughs) highlight There's also no fame because no one knows what it is. So <laughs> the key thing here in this scene, the reason why I bring it up, it's really short, but that Tico says he wants to turn himself in. And Frank's like, no way. I'm taking care of this. For once, Tico was trying to complete something. He was trying to finish <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, yeah. He's like, she laughed at my PP, So I choked the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Over at the precinct, the duo and Castillo are going through the, the details of the Morales case. And Frank, walks in and frank overhears that they have a meet with morales and frank immediately is like i can't believe you went around, you went behind my back fuck you guys i'm out of here yeah and that's when castillo's like, eh. <laughs> we followed protocol yeah. tough shit <laughs> yeah and crockett well he should have been notified and he's like eh, i don't care yeah what i love about the scene is when it starts out they each have an individual file they each have a different one and they all ended like sorting through it. Like, there's just a ton of paperwork here, and we don't get any information from the paperwork. Like, are they just a bunch of blank pages they're holding? Or... <laughs> yeah, I mean, nothing <laughs> is just really... trying to look important. Yeah, nothing's really talked about in the scene except for that they got a meet- uh, that meeting with Morales, and he wanted to know why he didn't know about it. Which also begs the question, like, why didn't anyone on the vice team go like, that was a really weird reaction? Well, he, well, Crockett did, though. That's why he's like, well, it's all with his eyes. He can act with all with his eyes. He doesn't have to say anything. The look on Crockett's face is like, why are you acting like such a jerk, bro? It's not that big of a deal. You're my friend. I've never seen you be this way before. And also, how come you didn't tell him Castillo? Which means you think Castillo knew something? He's like, nah, I don't trust him. Yeah, I don't know. I don't mm-hmm. know. But of course, Frank, immediately what he does, he runs out to a payphone, calls Morales and he, he says, He goes hey. out to this. Oh, hold on. Hold on. I've got this. So Frank goes immediately out to this weird box in, in a parking lot somewhere with this coin-operated phone uh, just in the middle of the parking lot. Like, I don't know. I've never seen one of these these things. Some people use so, them as bathrooms, apparently, it, uh, some Something about, I guess they're in Miami only, where you can just go in the middle of parking lots and, and make phone calls. Like, what do you do if you need to look at directions? How do you get... I, you don't. Or, <laughs> Well, just, what if you don't have how, how do you send text on that thing? <laughs> <laughs> what and Frank, who's like just been turned, right? He's been a lifetime US customs agent. He's a friend of Crockett's. Like personal friend. Crockett says other. he's a great cop. He calls Morales and goes, Cooper and Burnett are cops. Of all the things he could have done, <laughs> couldn't he have like done something else, like just stalled it out or gave him the yeah. wrong information? He busts out that they're cops and then he later on he's surprised that they want to murder them, that people want to kill the cops. It's like, yeah. what do you think you were doing? You were going to get him murdered. <laughs> I, this next scene too, this next scene is because they come into the scene it's Frank sitting on uh out in the stands and he's at he, you know hollering to his brother you know go to the left no <laughs> no bend your knees you know and then crockett <laughs> comes up and we get this really nice scene where we learn that frank is a part-time coach he's a full-time best friend forever for crockett <laughs> Yeah, he talks about how he ra- basically raised him. His pa- their parents died when he was young. But mm-hmm. yeah, I like how he tells him, go, take go take a, a nice shower. walk together. <laughs> Frank is like... like they just like, they're, they're holding hands and just... Well, remember, Highlight High Lie is such a big sport that they need to protect Tico. But meanwhile, the coach can be a full-time customs agent and a part-time coach for the professional league yeah no i just think he was like a stage mom he's just like telling him what to do over his shoulder all the time so i'm saying like when he was done he basically he's like go take a shower and say hi to crockett too 
like Kai Crockett. The real coach can get it. Yeah, the, the real coach, the real somewhere coach else. couldn't get out of his shift at Foot Locker. <laughs> no, the real coach is that guy making those little coffees at that coffee stand. Probably. What's weird about the scene is how it ends. Is that Sonny asks Frank about more information about Morales, so Frank goes, "I got nothing." Yeah, he's like, yeah, "I was all in stitches. Yeah. I got nothing." And Crockett's like, "What? <laughs> what is going on here?" <laughs> but he's got that face the whole time. But then at the end, when he gets into the boat, he's like, "It's a double cross." And he's like, "He's like shocked by it." Like, like, wait a minute, it kind of looked like you put this together yeah, sooner. What but... were you doing with the Scoopy face like, this entire time? Whoa, whoa. We have a brief scene where Gina and Trudy are working the street hookers trying to find out more information, but they're getting nowhere. The next morning, Croc is back at his favorite coffee stand, but yeah. this time Tubbs is with him. Apparently, this is where they, they brunch. Yeah. Tubbs has done some cop work. <laughs> yes, he's he's an actual police officer, and he uncovered a picture of Morales with Mrs. Batista and her dad. And that's not her dad, her, her uncle. uncle. Her uncle. Who's like, I guess, some big time drug dealer. We don't yeah. know. They never yeah, they tell talk, us. They talk about they, they were all in business together. And this yeah, yeah, but that's all we get. Like, they're just in business <laughs> together. We just know he's fat. <laughs> Crockett gets a call at the coffee shop, and it's Morales. He wants to have to meet. 5 p.m., roof of the parking garage, which is not really the roof of the parking garage because Castillo and the other vice members They're are on, on the roof. roof. Of parking garage. <laughs> no, it's a different parking garage, though, right? They're on a higher one, a really high one. Then, <laughs> yeah, crap, that's a really high parking garage. You know, the backup needs to be seven blocks down the street. They were like 700 million feet in the air above it. <laughs> Stay there while we fire up the helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just going to catch catapult you down <laughs> so we have our setup so we have our we're, we're five o'clock meeting at 3 30 that they're going to do their meeting as a vice team to figure out who's going to do what at that meeting at the precinct castillo is telling everyone but crockett can't get a hold of frank frank was supposed to show up to the meeting no one knows where frank is and crockett's like that's kind of weird and castillo's like eh, i don't care this is about dead hookers. So I really don't care. Yeah, he's like, it's going down without him or not. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Frank or no Frank, we're doing it. Did I tell you I never liked that guy? <laughs> yeah, so like the meeting starts to get set up, and then we get this very strange snuff film montage. He just keeps watching that video uh, like over Frank's and over just again. The video over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, like, yeah. We get this focused in on his brother's like O face. <laughs> This is when he finds out his brother really, he really was enjoyed <laughs> strangling that hooker. <laughs> so yeah, Frank is pacing back and forth. Tico's doing drugs and crying. It's a very really weird montage. This is also the second montage. We have one more montage to go <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> Your standard drugs, crying, snuff film montage. <laughs> so then we go over to the deal. Switek and Castillo, no... No Zito, by the way. No Zito. No Zito. Mm -hmm. No Zito. <laughs> Switek and Castillo and other cops are stationed on the parking garage in a different county. And <laughs> <laughs> they're worried that no one is going to show up. But Morales is a limo. Sorry, I missed the scene just really fast. There's a scene where Bautista is telling Morales to go kill these cops. And he's like, I don't want to kill cops. It's bad. That's too much heat. And she says, deal with it, punk. Like, yeah, she's ruthless. She's yeah. like, listen, I'm the, this is my yeah. idea. No, I'm the one that came nice up tea. with it. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> don't make me have my big armed security guard beat you up. <laughs> Morales' limo comes pulling up, backs into a spot. Crockett and Tubbs come pulling up. And they start walking over to the limo. And while Castillo is watching... There's an emergency call patched through from Frank. Because he's his and, conscience got to him. And he says, tell them that it's a setup. And bef But before Castillo can radio it down, a it's man a is trap. hiding down the stairs. And I don't know how they didn't see him before. He's hiding down the stairs on the front garage, hits the button, and makes the car explode. But clearly jumped the gun. Because he had, if you would have yeah. waited like thirty seconds more, he would have done his job. Well, yeah, I clearly he just, got, yeah, he clearly has just like an itchy, uh, itchy finger. He just he, he he hits the button and like while they're still standing next to the other car, and obviously he's there to kill Crockett and Tubbs. Like she pimp ordered him to, <laughs> even though they radio down and say like it's a trap. Like if he just waited thirty seconds would have mission accomplished what i was gonna say is i think he was supposed to kill morale he was supposed to kill them too yeah 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 so yes, he, yeah but he was supposed to take them all out yeah oh yeah for yeah. sure yeah but i was gonna say but he, yeah she meant to kill them too because she's but. because we find out later as you mentioned melissa that when they're 
going through the crime scene and Crockett and Tubbs didn't die in the explosion, but they find out that the Sifts inside of the car were Morales and Silvio. Mm -hmm. So Batista has killed them now, too. Yeah. Yeah. Morales got fired. (laughs) (laughs) Back at the highlight court, Frank has come over to talk to Tico. And he's getting ready for a game. The guys in the locker room are harassing him about his drug use. But Frank pulls him aside and says, hey. bad acting. Yeah, I think those are real highlight players because they were some <laughs> terrible acting. We don't like that in yeah. our sport. This sport's clean. Like, okay. <laughs> yes. Frank tells Tico, hey, whatever happens, don't say nothing. But I'm going to get the tape back because we know how take, that goes. I'm going to take care of this. Yeah, yeah. basically. But don't, if the police come to you, don't say anything. You don't know anything. To ruin your professional career. <laughs> Just, I swear to God, they act like, like he's an NFL or like an NBA player, you know? <laughs> Meanwhile, Gina's still doing the legwork with the hookers. And she talks to one. She finds out they're like an acquaintance of the one that was dead. And they find out that the acquaintance says, of which the, the hooker's name was Luis, finds out that her friend or acquaintance, that Luis stopped being a hooker, like a street hooker and a stripper, and instead became like a high-class prostitute sleeping with athletes. And by the way, the one that she bragged about all the time that she was able to push around really easy was this guy who played highlight. Because he was impotent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she even told her friend it that. Is, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Evil. <laughs> at the precinct crockett is still looking for frank he's trying to get a hold of him he call he's calling his phones and castillo comes walking over and says that gina has linked up tico to the killing of luis the hooker and asked crockett to bring him in so now we're in the final two scenes of, of the episode here we head back over to the highlight court we see the tico's in the middle of his game but on the sideline are miami police department and tubs and crockett and he's distracted now i'm gonna i'm gonna argue the side that he doesn't do this on purpose that this is an accident so because i think melissa you feel that he does this on purpose yeah i think he feels yeah, this, yeah it's purpose, so yeah. while they're playing He's looking at the cops. He's looking. I'm with you, Dominic. You got to keep your head on a swivel. (laughs) He's watching the cops. He's playing the game. And then he throws the ball off the ponton, I think is what it's called. Yeah, the ponton. And then you see a slow motion of the ball coming towards his face. And then they go to where he's down. So he's he's taking his brain a, a highlight ball. So, John, what is your stance on this? Is this... On purpose or an accident? I think it's an accident. He's a cokehead. He's probably coked up right now. Mm -hmm. I think he chucks the ball, is distracted because he knows the police are closing in on him and isn't paying attention. It's just hell of a shot. I mean, just lucky shot right back into the head there. You know, probably going about 150 miles an hour, which is, you know, once again, like I said, you got to keep your head on a swivel. (laughs) You know? <laughs> Which begs the question: so, but, Why don't they have a front part on their helmets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Well, Melissa, you feel that he does this on purpose because he sees all the cops and everything around him. No, yeah, I totally think he did it on purpose because he had no other way out. He felt like he had no way out, and he was done. And he had been trying to tell his brother for so long, like, "Let me just turn myself in. Let me do it this way." He was trapped, right? Because mm-hmm. even if he didn't kill that hooker, he wasn't happy. He yeah. was never happy. So I think he did it on purpose. If he makes that shot, that means he's like the LeBron James of Highline. <laughs> well, maybe he is. We know th- we know nothing about Highline. I'm just saying. I just think the look on his face when mm-hmm. he sees the ball coming towards him and he takes it like you, he had, there's that brief second where you see he see his face when he's he like getting, getting face. hit. He takes it right in the face. <laughs> yep, right in the head. No. I think he did it on purpose. Well, when the police come running out. Crockett runs over to him, and with his last breaths, Chico basically Whispers, says, "Take." Rosebud. <laughs> he says, "Take." Turns out it was the name of his sled. <laughs> with his last breaths, he says, "Tape Frank and Batista." Just enough to let Crockett know there's a tape. There's a tape. Frank knows about it. Frank is out. Frank knows about it, and it includes Batista. And then Chico dies. <laughs> <laughs> Not uh, can we please talk about the medical staff in this thing? They run out there, <laughs> but after he got, after they think he's dead, they move his head around a couple times. And like, um, I think that's like the exact thing you're not supposed to do with someone with a head injury. Like, nod his head for him a couple times, and then once he died, once they're like, "Yeah, he's dead." 
the medic guy like holds his hand very gently. Yeah. He's dead. What are you holding his hand for now? It reminds me of this meme I saw uh, saw on the internet where these guys come running out on a soccer match. They load the guy up on the stretcher, pick him up, and he falls off the stretcher. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was even if he was going to survive, he's not going to survive if you shake his head a bunch of times. <laughs> yeah. So now Crockett knows there's got to be a link here, and he, he just puts it together that there must be a blackmail tape that Frank is trying to take care of. And so he's off to go try and kill Bautista because he's going to try and take care of it. So they're going to race out to Bautista's to go stop Frank from killing her. At Bautista's, Frank has shown up. Bautista sees on the news that a highlight player had been killed and sees the picture that it's Tico. So she comes downstairs, meets with Frank. Frank hands her over the code. She's very happy and says, hey, Luis, my muscle, why don't you take him out back and kill him? We don't need him anymore because we don't have any authority over him. We've lost our mm-hmm. our rule over him because his brother's now dead. Well, he doesn't know that, though. Yeah, he doesn't know it he yet. He doesn't know that, and she's dumb enough not to turn off the news. Yeah, I know. What an idiot. I mean, she's like, oh, you don't know. You really don't know. Like, why did she say that then? <laughs> yeah. Frank pulls the gun out, shoots and kills two bodyguards. The duo comes swinging in. They kill two more bodyguards, and Frank in has Bautista in a headlock. Mo. Yes, in ultra slow mo. And muscles got it. She got it. She's dead. <laughs> the muscles in the dress. She's gone. <laughs> so now Frank has Bautista in a headlock, and the news is playing. He hears that Tico has died. He lets, in his grief, he lets Bautista go. She starts to run. Tico says, "No, wait!" Turns and fires his gun as Croc is yelling, "No!" Freeze frame. Episode over. So I do want to point out in so many episodes at the end where they don't, the vice team doesn't want to pull the trigger, but they have to. The bad guy makes them and and they always Mm -hmm. pull the trigger and kill the bad guy, right? In this one, because it's their friend, his friend, Frank, he's going to shoot Batista. And so he goes to shoot Batista. And even though Crockett and, and Tubbs have their guns out, rather than shoot Frank, they're just like, no, <laughs> and, they, and then you hear the gun go off. Like they just let him do it. Also, Batista was quick to say, like, it was a setup. She wasn't really dead. We set up Tico. Like, yeah, she I know. Blurts she it out. blurts it out. Miss <laughs> Evil conniving. She blurts it all out as soon as it comes to her. She didn't have anyone to protect her anymore. Which, well, why I'll... did she blurt that out? Like, how is that going to help her not get shot by a friend? <laughs> I don't know. I, like, I shoot because he's dead for nothing now, right? Yeah. Like, for sure yeah, he's exactly. dead for nothing. Yeah. That's even worse. Yeah. Well, that does it for this episode. I'm going to save my other thoughts for, for my final thoughts. Let's first go check in on the music because it is significant in this episode. All right, John, there is a ton of music in this episode, but it also fits the theme of the episode being a sport that's mostly played in Latin countries and involves a lot of Latin people. They, I think my Vice did a pretty good job picking out the music for this episode. Yeah, but Vice is going to kill me. <laughs> it, you know, four songs, you know, I spend quite a bit of time working on music to get good information about four songs. Eight songs is death. Like, <laughs> way to ruin my morning, Vice. <laughs> so we, we're gonna go through this kind of quick and some of this so and there, there'll be a little theme here and some of them will run through because some will visit later and some we've already visited so let's get started we start out with eminence front by the who on the album it's hard 1982 we have already talked about the who and eminence front is actually a fantastic song such a fantastic song that CBS planned to use it as the opening for their proposed CSI London series. Oh, which interesting. actually never made it off the ground. Yes. Huh. So if you didn't think there was enough CSIs, as in CSI, CSI New York, CSI Miami, yeah, they wanted to make a London one too, but the BBC <laughs> wasn't having it. I will admit too, like I love this song. But also, I'll admit that when I was young, like 13, 14 years old, and I first heard this song, and I was like, I didn't think they were saying Eminence Front. I thought they were saying, put it in the butt. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, I, I agree. What? I didn't think they were saying Eminence Front, but I was. I, I, I did not go there. That is, uh, I, I'm going to have to listen to it again. To yeah, every, time, every time we hear it, we're going to be like, put it in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was something something funk, you know, because it's kind of a funky song. But yeah, uh, I, I'm with you. I didn't realize that that was this. W- when I saw the name of the song and I heard the song, I was like, that's what they're saying. <laughs> song is 
Mercy Street by Peter Gabriel off the album So from 1986. Peter Gabriel, you're weird. This I song we already established is that. <laughs> we have. So this song was dedicated to the poet Annie Sexton. Annie Sexton, who lived from 1928 to 1974. In 1974, when she committed suicide. The title refers to a play called Mercy Street that she wrote in 1969. Uh, so, and that's that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's just move on. Our next songs are Respleta and Falsa. And I'm probably saying those wrong because I'm sure there's they're both basically salsa songs. It's by Billy Willie and Bashid. Yeah. I was looking at the name too. It's like just I C H E. Yeah. Billy the, Willie. <laughs> yeah. Billy, comma, Willie. <laughs> Interesting. Here is the thing about Billy Willie and Bashid or whatever. There's zero information. I looked everywhere. I Googled every possible way. All I could find, this album on eBay. I couldn't find (laughs) anything about anything really about the album or the artist. I know it was made in 1982. It looks like it was the the singer and the person who arranged the music was named William Sanchez. And I got that from a picture of the back of the album. Not even from a website, like a biography. No, I saw a picture of the back of the album and I was able to discern that it was an arrangement by William Sanchez. I guess it was a one-time gig. Vice Wikipedia stated that it was a one-time gig recording in Miami, but according to the back of the album, it was it it comes from Dakota, Colombia, and based on either a name or the name of so it is a La, La Rumba Furiosa, and it has something to do with Puri Guanco, which I guess is a subgenre of Cuban rumba. But I'm also pretty sure sure that that's actually someone's name who worked on the production <laughs> of it because I saw their Facebook, but it's more. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you did. You found out more about that album than anyone has ever found out. It is really rare, and it's actually not that expensive on eBay. So if you like <laughs> it, go for it. Anyone's looking for it. So our next song is Real Wind Child by Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop was born James Newell Osterberg Jr. on April 21st, 1947. So he old. <laughs> um, just just going to just do a quick, uh, because Iggy Pop hasn't been featured in the music before. We're going to talk a little more about him than, than anyone else. He played in multiple high school bands until and until 1968, used, used the stage name The Iguana. In 1968, he formed The Stooges. The first two albums didn't sell very well, and they kind of broke up in 1970. Mostly due to Iggy Pop's heroin use. A 1971, <laughs> yeah, could be a problem. In 1971, Iggy Pop met David Bowie, and David Bowie and produced Iggy Pop and a reformed Stooges band. He produced their next couple albums. The band would eventually break up for good in 1975, in which Iggy Pop would go solo, and Bowie would go into rehab in the together and the late. 70s. Apparently, they were homies. <laughs> so Pop and Bowie, during their rehab stint and going into the 80s, co-write a bunch of songs together. David Bowie would actually cover Iggy Pop's China White in 1983, which would kind of propel Iggy Pop back into popularity. In 86 and in 1990, Iggy Pop had, would have his most success, especially as a solo artist, with his albums Blah 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 and Brick by Brick, and Brick by Brick would produce his only top 40 hit, Candy. He'd release seven more albums from 1990 to, 19, uh, to 2009, and then in 2010, Iggy Pop and the Stooges would be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Most recently, Iggy Pop in 2006 recorded an album with Queens of Stone Age member Josh Homme called Post Pop Depression. So if you're wondering what Iggy Pop's been up to. Our next song in the music is You're Gonna Change by the Screaming Blue Messiahs. They're an English rock band formed in 1983. Their first album, Gunshy, in 85 featured this song. So this was like right as they were starting to get popular. Their second album, Bikini Red, which dropped in 80. featured their most famous song, I Want to Be a Flintstone, which would later be used in the Flintstones movie. Yeah, I know. Your most famous song is a song about the Flintstones. Good job, guys. (laughs) Way to break the mold. 
Their third album in 89, Totally Religious, would be their last album. They would be dropped from their uh, label, Here's Our Connection, while touring with David Bowie. <laughs> Man, David so, Bowie hey, in the music know, segment has a lot of connections, like including last week where some of his equipment got stolen by the Sex Pistols. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Someone in Vice this season has a thing for David Bowie. Because he's all over this music. He, he's our new... Him and Peter Gabriel are our new Phil Collins. The band would break up for good in 1990. The band members would go on playing different, a couple different bands, including a band called Dynamo Hum. Kenny Harris, specifically, would enjoy stints of being a house husband, a baker, and an author. So, <laughs> not quite the edit. Not quite living the rock, rock star lifestyle, but uh, <laughs> could be worse. Our next song, Desire by Yellow, as in Y-E-L-L-O, not like the color yellow, but as in like, <laughs> yeah, I think you get it. We're not going to talk much about them because apparently they have three more appearances. I, I, I don't know how. But, Damn. Um, Damn, how did they get yeah. three more music appearances? When I looked up the band <laughs> yes. Yellow, I'm like, okay. <laughs> They're a Swiss techno pop band. They're actually pretty popular, and they were used in a bunch of media for absolutely no... I can't figure out why. Basically, they're made up of members Dieter Meyer on vocals, the Carlos Perón, who was featured, who was a founding member, was featured on the first two albums, and then basically Boris Blank did everything else. <laughs> Just everything else. He was like the drummer. The uh, he, he like mixed the albums. He like you do. Yolo is Boris Blank featuring Carlos Peron <laughs> and <laughs> Dieter Meyer. So. <laughs> And we will talk about them in future episodes. So lastly, we have You Want to Get Away by Shannon. Shannon being Brenda Shannon Green, American dance and R&B singer. While she was attending York College, she toured with the New York Jazz Ensemble, where she would meet Mark Liggett and Chris Barbosa, who would produce her debut album, featured her signature song, let the music play and i thought let the music play sounds familiar yeah no it wasn't that song uh, oh. <laughs> i was thinking of a different song but it did manage to get number three on the hot billboard hot 100. her song intro style was known as freestyle music which was a latin based dance beat that was popular in miami and new york from the mid 80s to the early 90s which i think just freestyle music i mean that's kind of a generic thing for for you to take credit for. But sure. That wouldn't last long for her. She would only chart with two other songs. Give Me the Night being one of them. And then she would leave her label. Her record label. Uh, in 1987. Wouldn't release another album until 1981. Shortly after she would be featured in VH1's One Hit Wonders show. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> since then she's had. Yeah. Since then she's actually released a few more albums. But no one cares. <laughs> so there's your music. <laughs> well, John, what I appreciate about this music segment is that you did have this vast music collection you're able to boil down pretty quickly. And some people who like Yellow who will make repeat appearances, mysterious appearances. Like why? <laughs> but it's also our f first music segment yeah. as joined by one of your dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 I, one of my pit bulls tends to snore a little bit, uh, especially when she sleeps on her back like this. We don't so, want to miss her contribution um, to the show. They're all good dogs, Bron. Yes. <laughs> Be sure in future episodes, we will get an earful about Boris Blank and everything he does with Yellow. And Shannon... Why did you wait 10 years to release another album? <laughs> you really, you, you're going to wait until you're on a one hit on that show? VH1 success. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Know Maybe about you me. wouldn't be a one hit wonder had you released something, you know, between 87 and 99. <laughs> well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. All right, Melissa, I'm going to have you kick off this section on your final thoughts. What are your final thoughts on this episode? That I was right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he did it on purpose. No, <laughs> I like this episode. It's uh, I like so many episodes in season three, so it's hard for me to be like, this is the best one. No, <laughs> I like this episode. It's good. It's all around encompassing. It, it's it's something that I didn't know about until I watched this episode. I had no idea what Highlight was. was. I had no idea what that was. And so watching this 
episode for the first time was like, is this a real thing? Or is this something <laughs> they only do in Miami that they're making this up? It also felt like it was a commercial for it too, the way they mm-hmm. were like. And then also with the way Crockett goes, oh, that that's a kill shot. You know. <laughs> foreshadowing what was going to happen at the end. You know? Yeah, no, I liked it. I think it was a very strange episode to me, though, because there was no Zito. I mean, I understand the back story on why there was no Zito, and that, that'll come up later on, obviously. Castillo was very weird in it. I don't know. I, I don't know what it was about that. It was very strange, and it was definitely a Crockett-heavy episode, which I don't, I'm not mad at, because I'm never mad at that. <laughs> well, I, I really, really liked this episode, and it's actually the first episode, I think, of Vice, where they got sports right. Like True. Basketball yeah. and, and the other ones, like, they've been kind of, meh. But this one for Highlight, like, it actually feels like they got it right. And I'm going to be totally honest with you, before we started this show, there was one episode of Miami Vice. I know we we said the reason why we started this show is because we had never seen an episode of Miami Vice. I had seen one episode of Miami Vice, and it was this episode. And I didn't even see the whole thing. I was yeah, like, I came, came in, house, in yeah. and out, and I saw that the episode was on round number seventeen from Melissa <laughs> watching the show. <laughs> yeah, but I, like I say, like I feel like this is the first sports episode that they got right. It was good. Drugs, hookers, um, high life, something unique to Miami. They got it all right. I love this episode. John, what are your final thoughts? I like the episode, too. Uh, I, I think it really had everything that that I enjoyed in the Vice episode. That being said, I want to see more of Badass Burnett. <laughs> I expect less music. Don't be deep. Don't be a deep bag. Come on. Um, and only thing that kind of annoyed me about the episode was how much they talked about Eli. Uh, you know, and it's it's nothing. I mean, I, it was cool. It was interesting to learn about a sport that I didn't even know existed. But at the same time. By the end of the episode, I got the feeling like they were like someone was investing money in this league and they were trying to like, we're going to help get this thing mainstream. They were trying to get it out there. Everyone needs to know what this sport is. This is going to be the next big thing, you know, and <laughs> this is what's going to replace um, the bailing dog tracks in your local city. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I, I thought for sure. Like this is the NFL's a fad. Pretty soon, this is the highlight league, you know? But all in all, I enjoyed the episode. So far, I think season three has been really good. Season three continues like this. It is going to be hands above season two. Yeah, actually, it's starting to feel like season two was kind of a downer. Right. Yeah. When you compare. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Miami Vice. This again was season three, episode three titled Kill Shot. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Give us your thoughts. Suicide or distraction? What is your stance (laughs) on that high lie? move by tico we want to hear it we want to hear from your emails go to heat at gmail.com you want to find other ways to contact us facebook twitter tumblr i think someone's out there maintaining that thing i believe you can find all those on our website go with the heat.com be sure to check out hey, what please, please please help us what what did you hear when you first heard eminence front by the way <laughs> <laughs> everyone's gonna think it's I have a feeling now. this would be this is gonna be great <laughs> Make sure to rate our show, too, on your podcast platform of choice. Give us, you know, I'm asked for it. Give us five stars. Give us a thumbs up. Whatever the highest rating is. Don't review the show, though. So as one of my favorite shows, we have concerns. They say don't write, don't actually write a review about the show. They suggest you write, uh, you respond to a question because no one ever reads the review. Just give it five stars and write a review. Instead of writing a review, how about you tell us? What was the first thing you heard when you heard the song Eminent Front? What did you think that they were saying? Go ahead and put that in the review on your podcast platform of choice. It'll help people find find our show that's gonna do it for us this week we appreciate you listening to us we'd love to hear from you and we'll catch y'all next time put it in the butt people (laughs) (laughs) it just shows what a pervert you are I'll was. tell you, I thought it was like like living in the funk or something was what I thought of what they were saying. Which would make more sense for a song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's like it's a lot more I never even it never dawned on me that it was but <laughs>